Priscilla Tennant, Associate Pastor of Christian Education. So glad to be with you. My pronouns are she and her. And I want to start off this morning with our first reading, which is actually a video. And it's going to capture four minutes or so of the funeral service of Rachel Held Evans. Some of you might be familiar with her work. And um, for others, I'm glad to introduce her to you because she's worth exploring. Rachel was an American Christian columnist, blogger, and New York Times bestselling author. She hailed from Daytona, Tennessee, and she wrote about faith, doubt, and life in the Bible Belt. She was 37 years old when she died. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did, and um, I'll, I'll bring it back when I start my sermon. Our second reading is from the Bible in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, and I'm reading from the Inclusive Bible. Bear in mind that at one time the men among you who were Gentiles physically called the uncircumcised by those who called themselves the circumcised, all because of a minor operation, had no part in Christ and were excluded from the community of Israel. You were strangers to the covenant and its promise. You were without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For Christ is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of hostility that kept us apart. In his own flesh, Christ abolished the law with its commands and ordinances in order to make the two into one new person, thus establishing peace and reconciling us all to God in one body through the cross, which put to death the enmity between us. Christ came and announced the good news of peace to you who were far away and to those who were near. For through Christ, we all have access in one spirit to our God. This means that you are strangers and foreigners no longer. No, you are included in God's holy people and are members of the household of God, which is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone. In Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in our God. In Christ, you are being built into this temple to become a dwelling place of God in the spirit. This is the good news of God. What can we extrapolate from this lofty letter that Paul wrote to the Ephesians that still remains relevant for us? And how does that relate to the funny but tra tragic eulogy of Rachel Held Evans by her youth pastor? Ephesians gives us an idyllic picture of a Christian community that is at odds with other letters from Paul, where we find scandalous behavior, persecution, arguments, and generous amounts of backbiting, gossip, and people meddling in each other's affairs. But the passage we read mentions none of those matters. When and how did things get so peaceful? Truth be told, there was plenty of conflict going on in fact, there was a war going on, but the enemies were not made of flesh and blood. Instead, Paul was trying to convey that the battle was against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. The principalities and powers that exercise their influence in a dimension not perceptible to human senses. These realities are ongoing but we're much too modern and sophisticated to talk openly about them, lest we sound too woo-woo. But if we don't claim that there are things going on that we can't see, hear, and touch, 
Can we honestly call ourselves spiritual people or a community of faith? And if when pressed, we admit that we might just believe in spiritual battles and dimensions that are imperceptible to us most of the time, how do we fight enemies that we cannot see? A close reading of this Ephesians text gets right to the heart of the matter. For Christ is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of hostility that keeps us apart, meaning at the time Jews and Gentiles. To use modern language, what Paul is describing sounds an awful lot like community building. The concept of community is both extremely simple and profoundly complex. Community is both a feeling and a set of relationships among people. Members of a healthy community have a sense of trust, belonging, safety, and care for each other. They also have an individual and collective sense that they can, as part of that community, influence their environment and each other. That's why at this church, we have a renewed commitment to paying attention to things like how we're structured and organized, to things like our bylaws and constitution, and what we pledge to each other to create a community of care. The end goal of this focus is that each of us knows how they are empowered to influence the community and each other. If we have no hope of changing each other, then we cannot call ourselves a healthy community. Remembering that community is also a feeling, the biblical text describes that feeling with precision. You who were far off have been brought near. In Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in our God. In Christ, you are being built into this temple to become a dwelling place of God in the spirit. What does it take for X member, let's call her Sandy, to feel belonging and safety within our community. It's probably not the exact same set of things that it takes for Y member, let's call him Dan, to feel belonging and safety. This requires us to face and negotiate identity and difference so that our community is organized to meet our members' needs. If this community, we, in this community, we say things like, everyone is welcomed and invited to fully participate. But isn't it more than an invitation? Don't we all need to play our part in order to thrive? And assuming that everyone does play their part, how do we imbue them with the power they need for real engagement? Probably means that some of us will have to give up some power. What about when their needs and goals are different from the majority of us? Are we willing to change who we are and how we do things for them to feel that we all have access in one spirit to our God and to what we need from the other community members? Issues of identity and difference in the letter of Paul to the Ephesians have provoked a long history of scholarly debate, particularly around the narrative of Jews and Gentiles becoming one new humanity out of two. Sounds pretty idealistic, doesn't it? Community is a meeting ground for participants from different traditions and experiences to explore the boundaries that differentiate us, as well as the bonds that connect us in relationship with one another. The pandemic that we are all living through, and many did not live through, affirm that we are bound together in this thing called community. But what lies does this idea of being bound together expose? What truth is it drawing us towards? The lie is that community comes easily, that it should come naturally and doesn't require a true commitment to work through the messiness that comes with boundaries, bonds, and negotiating identity and difference. Another lie is that we are all equally good at community building. In truth, marginalized communities tend to develop some of the strongest community builders because that's what allows us to fight against oppression, take care of each other when the government won't, and frankly, to survive. So when you hear the message to center trans people black and brown people or queer people. It's not just to be nice. Centering people with experiences leading healthy community will make us all stronger. 
What truth does being bound together draw us towards? The truth that is that we never know when we are encountering someone who is at the beginning of their metamorphosis. Rachel Held Evans, youth pastor, had no idea when she was questioning him in youth group that she was on the cusp of birthing all that she would become. We must spiritually challenge each other. In a world that has become less attuned to matters of faith, if we don't do this for each other, who will? We may not have what we need for our metamorphosis when all that we might become burst into life. Another lie that is exposed about being bound together is that we can spiritually grow alone without community. If we are to become a dwelling place for God in the spirit, we need to push each other, affirm the gifts we see in each other and admit when we don't have the answers. What does it mean to spiritually challenge each other? It means asking each other spirit guided discernment questions like, do I seem to be in alignment with the beloved? And what have you heard from God about how you can serve? It's about paying attention to the assignments coming our way and trying to determine what it is that needs to be healed. True community is about asking good questions and offering radical love and relentless support. By reconciling all people to God through the cross, Christ has created a new humanity and we are it. Mark Allen Powell, theologian and writer explains it this way. We are marked by peace rather than hostility. This is manifest in the church where we all have access to God and indeed compose what is now God's spiritual dwelling place. This new unity of humanity is the mystery of Christ and the church's role in the divine drama is to make the mystery more widely known both here on earth, but also even to spiritual powers in heavenly places. But to come to back down to earth for just a while, I thought I'd share a few quotes from Rachel Held Evans that get to the heart of why we ought to toil together as a community of faith. Rachel once said, the church is not a group of people who believe all the same things. The church is a group of people caught up in the same story with Jesus at the center. In her book, Inspired Slaying Giants, Walking on Water and Loving the Bible Again, she wrote, dignified or not, believable or not, ours is a God perpetually on bended knee, doing everything it takes to convince stubborn and petulant children that they are seen and loved. It is no more beneath God to speak to us using poetry, proverbs, letters, and legend than it is for a mother to read storybooks to her daughter at bedtime. This is who God is. This is what God does. Finally, she once said, I concluded that I am a Christian because the story of Jesus is still the story I'm willing to risk being wrong about. For better or for worse, friends, we are bound together. God made it that way, and this community stuff is hard, messy work. Thank goodness we're not in it alone. The only way to reach our highest God-given potential is by committing to each other and to the work of community. Let's toil together knowing that Christ Jesus himself is our cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows so that we might be built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. May all that we might become burst into life with the help of spirit and each other. This is the God, good news of God. Amen. <laughs>